Hey guys, welcome back, Skitzone series. This is not the average episode. This is a, a new new branch, and I use that term loosely around Kamsa people, a new branch off the tree of Skitzone. Not an episode, it's a lab. So I'll talk about what that means in a moment. The topic today is going to be Kramer's rule. What's Kramer's rule? It's the way you can solve systems of equations, and we're gonna implement Kramer, Kramer's rule to solve a physical example, a real life structural analysis problem um, from scratch in x86 assembly. So if that interests you, you can watch. Otherwise, you can leave. So up until now in this series, we've done exclusively episodes. Episodes are basically just us developing these library functions and these like elf headers and stuff to lay the groundwork for future software that we're gonna write. And I have huge plans for this series. Um, and we have multiple different examples per episode looking at the same type of concept from different angles and doing different things. And it's been very enjoyable for me to make these different examples. And all the code has been available. It's all on the Soy Hub suppository, but there's been no live programming. This, however, is a lab video, meaning it's gonna be a one-off executable. We're gonna be leveraging and synthesizing content that we've already covered. We're going to be using functions from our previous episodes. We're going to be just using them to solve some particularly useful prob problem. And we're gonna have a single main example per video and uh, the code will be available. But the difference here is that we're gonna implement this in real time. So I'm gonna do like live programming in assembly that you guys can follow along, not live streamed, but just uh, in, in real time you can follow. And the reason for this is because I was talking to somebody over DMs a few weeks ago, and they were saying, even though they have, they probably have way more experience than me in programming and even in assembly, it felt like they didn't really know how to, or how they would go about programming something from scratch in assembly. Like they would know how to use inline assembly. They know what the instructions do. They know kind of, they know way more than me and anybody watching probably about the stuff, but they wouldn't know how to go about starting something from scratch. Um, and this series has all been about, you know, programming and assembly from scratch. We even have, you know, thrown away the linker. I mean, everything here is entirely from scratch. So I figured, hey, why don't we just make some videos once in a while, every, you know, five or 10 videos, maybe, maybe a little bit less, um, where we just synthesize old content and we just implement something from scratch that's kind of fun and quick and one off. And we can kind of show that, yeah, you can program things in assembly, by itself without C, without inline assembly, without other crap like that. And you can make valuable software without having to use, you know, C or anything else. So it's, that's the reason for this little bit of a video here. And also it's easier for me to make this video because I don't have to spend, you know, a full week um, developing multiple examples and all library functions and stuff. It's easy for me once in a while just to take a, take a load off and just implement something simple and, uh, and go through the theory behind it. So today's topic is Kramer's rule. And so I didn't know anything about that. I asked uh, Mandark, I think it's Mandark, what it was. Um, and he says, yeah, it's a method to solve linear systems. So pretty much, I mean, if you're an engineer or a physicist or in math, you, you already recognize that pretty much everything is just a linear system and it needs to be solved. Um, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, aeronautical engineering, Everywhere you look, it's all linear systems. It always has been. And even when it's not linear, you make assumptions to uh, boil it down to a approximate linear system and then you solve that. That's the general approach to solving almost every problem that I've ever been exposed to in engineering. It's just plug it into a linear equation solver and, and, and then go. And so the cool thing about Kramer's method or Kramer's rule or whatever you want to call it is that it's very simple to understand, simple to implement, it's very elegant in my opinion, and it has a very cool geometric definition that relates very well to what linear algebra is. I think the one problem about linear algebra is like, at least when I was taught it in um, you know, high school and in, actually even in middle school in, in the United States um, and, and in college, like they don't teach it from a geometric perspective. They teach it from like algebra, like equations. And that's so bad because people don't know what it means. Like they don't recognize that like what a vector really is. Like when you're solving a system of equations, you're solving for, you know, scaling of vectors, right? But people don't internalize that until they get much older and if, if they do at all. And so I think it's a shame that we don't spend enough time, 
you know, explaining geometric understandings of these things. I think geometry is the coolest thing. So the one problem with Kramer's rule is that it's not it's not efficient computationally. In fact, you're 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 basically doing things that you don't need to do in order to solve a linear system. Like you we're trying to solve for an unknown by going through a process that it would have been easier just to solve for the unknowns in a different way. Um, but it you know that being said, it is pretty interesting how it works geometrically. It's very nice. And honestly, who cares about computational expense if it's so fast? You know, for equations for I mean systems of like n equals zero equations, that's easy. One equation, two equations, three equations, even four equations. I think you could do this by hand in a testing period for a college class. Like it's not unrealistic to solve n equals four systems of equations, in my opinion. So yeah, for those things, I think Kramer's rule is awesome. I think it's intuitive and easy to remember. And it's the algorithm is just so simple and straightforward and has an awesome geometric understanding that I think it warrants people knowing about. So that's why I'm making this video. So when it comes down to Kramer's rule, it's basically just parallelograms, parallelograms. What is that? It's like a diamond shape, like a rhombus, but the the two opposite sides are parallel. So it's like a rectangle, but it can be skewed off to the side. And you look here, the area of a parallelogram is the same as the area of a rectangle, um, just the base times the height. And the why that works is because basically you just take this little edge piece and put it over here and there you go, a rectangle, right? So that's why that works. But the cool thing about it, about these shapes is that the area is only a function of base and height. The angle doesn't matter. And so basically, let's say you you increased h by a factor of three. Well, then the area would increase by a factor of three, exactly. And if you increase the base, this length here, by a factor of pi, the area would go up, area would go up by a factor of pi, exactly. Not approximately, exactly, that's how it's defined. Well, not, well, this is what it is. <laughs> and the other thing is that the skew doesn't matter. So this angle here, it doesn't make a difference. I can have another parallelogram, as long as the base and height are the same, this parallelogram here has exactly the same area because the base is the same, this value here is the same as this value here, and the height is the same. This value here matches this value here. So the areas are the same, not, the skew doesn't matter, <laughs> okay? Long story short, the angle here doesn't make a difference to the area. And those two things are extremely important, and that's the entire basis for Kramer's rule. If you if you understand this, you already understand the full the full way to solve these equations. Now, determinants are just a trick to compute the area. So if you don't have base and height, because remember, these are kind of things that you wouldn't have. Like we're talking about systems of equations here, you don't know. I mean, what does this what does it even mean? What is the base and the height? There's no meaning to that. So typically what you'll have instead is you'll try to generate the area or compute the area with, you know, regards to the side length or the sides of the parallelogram. So let's say this side and this side. Basically, if you take the two vectors that define those two sides, you can see here the bottom one, I've called that, you know, x, the x length is a and the y length is b. And so this column vector is just this side vector of the parallelogram. In a similar way, you know, this side length here, that's just the the x dimension is c and the y dimension is d. And so that's just this column vector. And so basically, if you take the determinant, which is just some kind of fancy thing of those, you know, the set of column vectors that define the sides of this parallelogram, or even in 3D, they have another equivalent shape in 3D, uh, in higher dimensions, you basically get the area or the volume or whatever else in higher dimensions it's called of this shape. So in 2D, you take these two two by two column vectors, take the determinant of that, and that will give you, it will spit out the, the area of this yellow shape, which I'm calling A in pink. And the cool thing is, is that the algorithm that you may have been taught already, you probably were for determinants of a two by two or three by three matrix, um, you know, in this case, it would be, you know, this diagonal minus this diagonal is what they teach you to, to do. So AD minus BC, that is the same as if you were to look at the parallelogram and then figure out the components of this 
area. So this full rectangle here is, well, the, the, the width is A plus C and the height is B plus D. And so the width of the entire shape is this. And then if you were to look at the constituent parts of this shape, you have, you know, two squares of size or two rectangles, I should say, of size BC. That's this. You have uh, two triangles of size DC. So that's this one and this one. And if you were to put them together, that would be DC. Similarly, you have um, AB triangle, two of them, and add them together, that's a rectangle of size AB. And then you have the middle, the middle shape here, just we're calling it A. And if you solve for A, and you do all the, the checking here, you can pause the video and take a look, it's the same. So the definition that, we're, that you've been taught for determinants, AD minus BC, is the same as the geometric understanding that you'd have if you just drew a rectangle with the parallelogram inside and then just figured out how big the pink region is. So cool. And that extends to higher dimensions to 3D, 4D, 12D, etc. I think if I'm wrong about that, I'm sorry I lied to you. Okay, great. Now, systems of equations. So, and this is where like, I think it's important that we learn about the geometry. We talk about the geometry because like I think at least when I was taught, we were taught this in a, like an algebraic sense, like what what this equation means algebraically. I think that's terrible. I think that's like that's like throwing kids under the bus. Like you don't let them learn what the what the actual definition is. I mean, kids. I mean, I don't know. I feel like maybe you can relate. People are better at understanding geometric things. Like even the dumbest person, you know, even dumber than me, understands like spatial things. And I think like if you just illustrate things spatially it it connects way better with people's you know thought process than if you just do it with symbols i think symbols are kind of cringe anyway so the idea is if you have a system of equations which is typically written out like this ax equals b so a is a is like a like coefficient matrix so here i've drawn a two by two one with the elements a11 a12 a21 a22 x is a vector of unknowns so these are what you're trying to solve for these are like the what, what, yeah, what you're trying to solve for, I guess, is the best way to put it. And then the right-hand side vector here, B, again, is just, uh, in this case, a two elements of known values. And so the idea is you have some equation. In this case, it would be A11, X1, plus A21, X1, equals B1. And then you'd have A12, X2, plus A22, X2, equals B2. Or you can draw it out like this. You take the first column vector times x1, second column vector times x2, and that sum is the resultant. Now, I think this should be this should be taught geometrically. So here's how this looks, right? This ultimately is just two vectors that you can visualize as sides of a parallelogram, and uh, yeah. So in this case, the the blue column vector here is on the bottom and the pink one is on the left side. But you know, whatever they happen to come out to be with, with if you plug and chuck the values in, whatever they happen to be gives you the, the shape of your parallelogram. And the idea is what values of X1 and X2 can scale this side and this side, not respectively, I set them backwards, but such that the sum of those two scaled vectors is this b1 b2 vector here so what's what what sum of what, what values x1 and x2 would you have to scale this side by and this side by such that when you were to sum up all of the scaled versions of those vectors you would get you'd point to where b is pointing that's what system equations are, and we don't teach them like that, but we should. I hope that made sense. And so the cool thing is, is basically, here's another drawing of that, basically. So if, if this side here was just the second column vector here, right, that's this side length, and you scale that by x2, now that points here. And the idea is to pick an x2 such that if you were to add this one and this one together, you would point to where the B vector is pointing. And so, yeah, you're scaling both sides. Or if you had a three-dimensional problem, you'd have all three sides or, 
you know, n dimensions, you'd have n, you have a vector of length n that you're scaling by n different unknowns, add them together, and that has to point to where the right hand side is pointing. So it's systems of equations, you're just trying to figure out what scale factors I need for all my different column vectors to point where the resultant is pointing. That is not taught, I don't think, in any productive way. <laughs> Anywhere I've seen it taught, it's not been taught like that, but it should be. So in this sense, solving a linear system is just determining the scale factors, in this case called x1 and x2, for the parallelogram sides, which are the columns of this matrix, so that when you sum up, you get diagonal B. Cool. Now, how does Kramer's rule leverage this kind of geometry? Well, the thing is, this goes back to that left-hand side thing that I drew before, where we said right here that the area of the parallelogram, it scales linearly with both base and height. So if I just change the height or the base, um, the area increases by that factor. So if I double the height, the area doubles as well. Or ultimately the base, if I double the base, the, the, it, it doubles as well in area. And so the idea is the area of this pink parallelogram, which is just, so let me, re, let me rephrase that. So th this side length here is just A12, A22. That's the vector of this side of the parallelogram. If I scale that by x2, it goes here. Now, if the base of this triangle or parallelogram, the, the, the bottom here, that is unchanged. That value is always going to be that column vector. And so the, 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 the concept here is that the area of the pink shape is just x2 times the area of the yellow shape. It's in a different sense, this red parallelogram, which by the way is defined with one of the sides as the, the right hand side vector, is the same area. So the area of the pink shape is x2 times the area of the yellow shape, but the area of the red shape is the same as the area of the pink shape. And why is that? It's because the skew doesn't matter. Remember that from before? The angle here doesn't make a difference. If I don't change b or h, the area doesn't change. And so back down here, you can see the base is the same for both the red and the pink shapes. It's the same value. And the height is the same as well. The height is from here to here or from here to here. And those are the same value. So the area of red equals the area of pink. And those areas are just x2 times the area of yellow. And so the idea is that you can basically write those uh, equivalences here. So the area of yellow times x2 is the area of the other two each. And then I can solve or I can compute the areas using the deter deter determinant. So basically remember the determinant of the matrix with the column vectors of the size of the parallelogram is the area of the parallelogram. And so here you can see the area of the yellow one is just the determinant of the original matrix. A11, A21, A12, A22, determinant of that times x2 will be the area of the pink and the red. The area of the red one, remember again, the area of the parallelogram is just the determinant of the column vectors, which are the sides of the shape. So in this case, the bottom is the same side as it was before. This is the original bottom. Here is the new bottom, it's the same. Now the left side, remember it used to be A12, A22, now the left side is actually this, which is B1, B2. And so instead of having, you know, A12, A22, which is here, we have B1, B2 here as the left side of our parallelogram. And so we just plug that in here. And so now you can see we have an equation with just determinants that we can use to solve for x2. And this is what it is. Basically, you just solve for x2 there. You just divide this determinant or this area by this area, right? The ratio of the red shape over the area of the yellow shape is the unknown value x2. And this is the same thing for x1 and x3, x4, x5. If you had that high order problem, it would be the same. 
So the way this works is you can see on Wikipedia, there's a you know just a very succinct algebraic definition um, with with the equation ax equals b. Basically, the ith unknown, so x1, x2, x3, x4 is just take is a determinant of the coefficient matrix a. If you replace the ith column of a with the column vector b, the right hand side vector b. And then you just divide that new determinant matrix, determinant of the new matrix by the determinant of the original matrix. That gives you the coefficient, the scale factor, xi. So all you have to do to solve for the coefficients is be able to substitute in rows or columns of matrices into each other, which is what ai is, and then evaluate the determinant. And in our case, we're going to use three by three determinants, which is this, and you may have learned this. There are different ways to represent this, you know, um, geometrically. You may have been taught like something like this, and this, you know, etc. That's fine. You may have been taught cofactors. I don't know what any of that stuff means, but basically, all you have to do is take the elements in these positions, either for a two by two or a three by three matrix, and then evaluate them algebraically like this, and you'll get the determinant. And so we're going to implement this in assembly in a few minutes. Cool. And now for our example. And I could have picked an example for electrical engineering. I could have picked one for, this is a structural engineering problem. I could have picked one in finance. I could have picked one in physics. I could have picked a thousand different examples. Um, this is just what came to me on Google. <laughs> um, and here's how we're gonna use Kramer's rule you know, for a useful piece of software. And the question here is solve, or I guess the instruction is solve for the internal forces F1, F2, F3 in these members here. F1, F2, F3 in the truss. And so if you if you know statics, you can just solve for the resultant reaction forces here, R1 and R2 at points 1 and 2, based off an input loading of 100 newtons, or whatever N stands for, maybe Neptunes. That's pretty heavy. Um, yeah, so in my case, I just solve for R1 and R2 using you know moment and force equilibrium. So I took the moment about 0.2, it said it was equal to zero. Um, and then based off the geometry here, this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. I computed that the reaction forces were a certain value. Let me go through that really quick. So a 30, 60, 90 triangle, you know for those, if you don't know, now you do that the short side is just half the hypotenuse. So if this side here was one, then this side here would be two. Similarly, this is also a, this big one is also a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And so in this case, the short side being two, the hypotenuse would actually be, this value here would be four. So what that means is basically that this reaction one is four times further than the input load, 100 newtons from 0.2, so the moment equilibrium, in order for that to not be rotating about 0.2, uh, you would need R1 to be one fourth what the input force was. So in this case, R1 is 25 newtons upwards. And then by taking the sum of forces in the y direction, you know that 100 down, 25 up, you know that you have to have 75 up at this point. So R1 equals 25, R2 is 75. With that, the question is now, can we solve for F1, F2, and F3? The answer, of course, is yes. But you have to, to, do, to, to do that, you need to be able to generate three equations that involve all these three unknowns. You, you can't leave any out. Because if your equations don't involve F3, you won't be able to solve for F3. And so in this case, I've taken the sum of the forces about 0.3, which is at the top. So it had that 100 Newton downward force, as well as the internal force in member one and member two at their corresponding angles. Some of the forces in the x and y direction, sine and cosine, here you can see just taking the force contributions in each direction. In the x, you just have f1 and f2 pushing. In the x direction, that's this way. y direction, you also have the input loading. Um, and so here you can see the two equations at about 0.3. And then for the, these two equations, actually, you could use these two equations to solve for f1 and f2. You have two equations here. And you have two unknowns, F1 and F2. So you, you could solve for F1 and F2 with just these two equations. But I want to solve for all three at the same time. And so we're going to generate 
a third equation. This equation has to involve F3, otherwise we can't solve for F3, and so I took the force equilibrium about 0.1, which was at the bottom right of that figure here, down here, and in the x direction, you have both F2 and F3 acting, and you only have cosine 30 fraction of F2 acting in that direction, and so here's the third equation. And the idea is, if you know what these trigonometric expressions evaluate to, in this case, I picked easy angles, and so sine and cosine of these values is, is a half, and these values is approximately 0.866, and so basically you can break those three equations, these three equations, and their unknowns into an expression like this. So I've pulled the coefficients out of that, those set of equations into this left-hand side coefficient matrix. I've put the unknowns in this green vector here, and I've taken the right-hand side and I put it in red here. And so right-hand side meaning what these equations equal Right, so here the right hand side equals zero. Here it equals positive 100. And then here it equals zero. So, yep, that's what we can boil down this physical problem to in a algebraic sense. And now all we have to do is use Kramer's rule to solve for F1, F2, and F3. And that's the project of this lab. That's what we're trying to do. And we'll do that from scratch in assembly right now. Okay, cool. So we're gonna start completely with the clean slate here. I don't even have the suppository installed on this machine. So we're gonna get everything from scratch. You will need NASM. NASM is an assembler. That's what we use to assemble our assembly code. And you will also need Git to get the suppository. And so I'm just gonna git clone um, the link https uh, github.com slash me slash skitzone. Okay, this pulled the suppository down. Now I have it. Let's go in there. And when you download that, you will have a couple things. Typically, we do all our examples in the example directory and we do all our library programming in the lib directory. So if I show you what's in lib, you can see I have a bunch of debugging functions, IO functions, math functions, memory functions, system functions, and timing functions. And we'll have many more in this series as, as time goes on. But in this video, it's a lab, so we're going to put things in the lab directory. So if we go into the lab directory, oh, before I do that, run the make bins shell script. It's not a virus, I promise. Uh, well, maybe it is. Um, that just generates a bin directory in that bin directory is a bunch of utilities that you can use one we're going to use is make executable um, that just turns binaries from just zeros and ones to being executable by the os just change the permissions on that so we need that for our software so we have that function now um, so let's go into the lab directory And in here, I have a template that we're going to copy. So copy template, and we're going to make a new lab. And you could make one either in here or elsewhere. I'm going to call mine 001 lab, or no, we'll call it uh, lab 001 Kramer's rule. You can follow along. You may have to change the name. It may be already existing by the time I upload this. So you just make your own uh, folder, uh, and we'll go in there. In this folder, we have two different files. One is a template. Hold on. One is this is just a template here. We're going to use this to generate to write our code. All it has is just a, a bare minimal executable. It just exits. So all we have is just syscalls and exit. And here's just the bare minimum elf header that we can we can work with. And also it has some accommodation here for printing because typically you want to print things to the screen. So I left the printing in the template. And then we have our run shell script. So you need to have a bash compatible shell. Um, so basically all this does, this is like a make file. Basically it just compiles our assembly code into a binary and it, it calculates, it computes if you're on Linux or BSD and it includes the corresponding syscalls. Um, and then it uses that make executable binary that we just created um, to 
change that set of zeros and ones to being executable as far as the OS is concerned, and then it runs that binary. So that's all it does. Let's look now into the code. And this is dark mode. I don't like dark mode for these videos. Let's do light mode. Okay. So we're gonna need a couple different things in this, a couple different things to include. So we always have to think about what we're going to be doing. Um, and we have to include some uh, functions here. So we're going to need the, actually, let me open up my actual thing here. This is the suppository. So let's see, in lib, we're going to need the, we have to be able to print out our results. I wanna print out an array of floats. So I'm just gonna snag this. Yes, 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 it's a virus. Thank you very much. Um, so this function, we're gonna use that to print out our arrays of floats. Let me just do that really quick. So it's in lib math, no lib io, print array float. Cool. We'll also need um, print cars. So let me snag that. Actually, it might already be included by this. Hold on, let me check really quick. Yeah, it already is included, so I don't have to bother with that include. If you include things multiple times, it, it doesn't matter because we have an if def on all our files. Let me show you that really quick. So if not defined, this will only be included if you've not yet defined this value. And so once you include this file once, it will never re-include itself. So you're never gonna have a problem where you're gonna have multiple includes of the same file. Anyway, enough about that. Um, print array float, we'll need that one. We'll also need, uh, we'll need mem copy and matrix insert column. So we'll need mem copy to copy our, our matrix. I'll talk about what that means in a second. Let me just include this really quick. So um, mem copy, I'll snag this. You have to forgive me, I'm not the best uh, Vim user. I know the bare minimum, enough to, to, to break stuff, as they say. Mem copy, we'll use that to copy our matrix back and forth into a temporary location. And uh, we'll also need something to math matrix matrix insert row, oh no, column, column. We have to be able to insert the right-hand side vector B into our matrix A. So we need this function. Let me snag this. Yes, it's dangerous, thank you very much. Include lib math matrix matrix insert column. ASM. Okay, that's all we need, I think, for this program. Just those couple of functions. Oh, we have to make a function. We have to make the determinant function, but we're not going to make that in an elegant way. We're just going to hard code that right now. So we'll have a function called determinant 3 by 3 and we're going to program that in a, in a minute. I'm not going to waste time right now. And then we'll also need some values. So I'm going to have it written down here, the uh, the matrix coefficients. So we'll, we'll need the A matrix. We'll need a, a determinant, like a temporary matrix where we're gonna put in the right-hand side vector to evaluate the determinant. We'll also need the right-hand side matrix B, and we're gonna need a spot to put our solution X. And so the solution, we don't care. That's just going to be, so let me show you. This, this solution vector here, that's just three double precision numbers. So each double is eight bytes. So this is going to be 24 bytes of space. I'm going to define it as times three DQ 0, 0.0. So it's going to initialize it basically to be three zeros. So it'll be zero, zero, zero. That's going to be the initial value. The 
right hand side vector here, I believe it was zero, let me put point zero, uh, 100, zero. Let me check. Yep, zero, 100, zero. Again, it has to be a floating point. You have to put the point zero to make it a floating point. Otherwise, it will just be an integer value, um, eight bytes long. And then I'm gonna, imp I'm gonna put this value into the A memory location. So up here, and again, I should say, even though it's a vertical vector, B was vertical, I, I can define this like this. I could say DQ zero, DQ 100, DQ zero, that's fine too. It's just the same thing. This is exactly the same meaning as uh, this, what I had before. And so I like this, it's a little bit more compact, easier to read. Anyway, um, for our A matrix, I'm gonna plug in those values. So we had a DQ 0 0.5 negative, and this is approximate 0 0.866, 0 0.0. Then we had the second row was 0 0.866, 0 0.5, 0 0.0. And then our last row that was uh, 0 0.0, 0. 0. 866, need a comma there, 1.0. That's our right hand, that's our uh, coefficient matrix. And now we just need a, a, a holding spot into which we can copy our A matrix and then replace each column into the A, we'll use this AI uh, memory location. So I'll say times nine DQ 0, 0.0. So I'm just gonna initialize it as a, um, a nine element double precision floating point memory chunk. Cool, those are all our input values and that's all our working space for, or it's all our Lebensraum, I should say, for uh, our, our program. Okay, I shouldn't have said that, that was really bad. Um, now let's implement our determinant function. So we just need to hard code basically this, this mathematics into assembly. So how can we do that? Well, I will show you how we can do that. Before I do that, let me um, put some, some comments here. So this function is going to return in XMM zero. That's usually how you return floating point values. That's how I'm doing it at least. Um, and it's called the terminant three by three and it will only take in one input, and that is the address or a pointer to the first address. Because we're gonna assume it's always gonna be three by three matrix, that's why it's called determinant three by three um, in RDI. What does this function do? This function uh, returns the determinant of the three by three double precision floating point matrix at starting at RDI. And I'm, I don't care so much about the column convention for this example. Normally we try to preserve all registers. I'm gonna say um, likely violates, I'd say it will violate, uh, violates calling convention by clobbering, probably we'll call our XMM1. Okay, so that's, Sort of like, if you were using C, that's how you would refer to this function. If you were to include this in a C header file, that's what you would write, I guess. So in this determinant function, we need to be able to basically just do the math that was described here. And so basically the way this works is, the address RDI points to element A. So this is at address RDI. Element B is at, RDI plus eight and so on. So C would be 16 offset, D would be 24 offset, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're gonna just implement this using floating point arithmetic based off offsets into our array that is just known because A is always gonna be zero offset, F is always gonna be 40 offset, for example. Okay, let's implement that. So first thing I'm gonna do is 
I'm going to use um, XMM1 to compute those intermediate multiplications. So I'm going to use basically XMM1 to compute this and this and this and this and this one at a time. I'm just going to add it to XMM0 to keep it running sum. So our sum of all this will be an XMM0 and XMM1 is just going to track each individual term in this addition. Okay. So first thing we'll do is we'll move into XMM1 the A value. So that's just that RDI plus zero. That's A. Then we will multiply against A. The next value in that term, I believe, was E. So AE. And E is offset by 32. Then we're multiplying that by, it was I. Let me show you before I get too far here. So basically I was just taking the offset of element A, element E, and element I from address A and register RDI, which we're passing into this function, to basically compute the multiplication of this term here. And then once I have that, by the way, I is that address, oops, 64, it's the last last one. And then we're going to just move that value into X and M0. So X and M0 comma X and M1. We're gonna save that term, that, that multiplication is just gonna be X and M0. That's gonna give us our first part of this running sum in X and M0. Cool. Now let's copy this uh, five more times. One two, three, four, five. And we're just gonna compute the other terms. So term two, that was B, F, G. Term three was C, D, H. Term uh, four was C, E, G, I'm just copying my notes here. B, D, I, and the last one was A, F, H. Now we have to adjust these instructions because they don't match anymore. So um, first let's adjust the offsets. So the offset to element B is not zero, it's eight. Then offset to F is 40, offset to G is 48. Offset to C was, what's uh, 16, I guess. Offset to D was gonna be 24 based off of that. And then H, it looks like it's 56, that's one before I. Um, offset to C again is 16. Offset to E, we have that already, don't we? 32, it's right there. And then G was 48. And then offset to B again is eight. D is, was it 24? And I is the last one, that's 64. And then A is zero, F is 40, right? 40, and then H is 56. That's the second to last one. All right, that gives all our offsets correct. We're using the right terms now, but the um, instruction is not correct um, for this. So in the first case, so basically, let me show you. We now, are computing for each of those steps the correct value of x m m one, but each time we're just moving it into x m m zero. I didn't change that instruction yet. Reality: the first one should be move. Then we should have an add instruction, add instruction, and then two, and then one, two, three subtract instructions. So let's do that really quick. So move, then add, add subtract, subtract, subtract. That should, now if I return, that should compute the determinant. Let me just make sure I didn't do anything stupid. Yeah, that should compute the determinant.
Okay, just making sure really quick before I make a fool of myself. That that matches, that should compute the determinant of a three by three matrix based off this algebra that we're showing here. Okay, with that out of the way, now we can actually do Kramer's rule. <laughs> we have our, our underlying function complete. Now let's do Kramer's rule. And so I should point out, uh, this is an address. Determinant three by three is an address of our executable. And when we call this function, it's just gonna be a jump to this address after we push the return value onto the stack. So basically start is where our program starts and that's evidenced by in our header file, in our elf header, you can see our entry point is at start. So when the OS loads our program, it will jump over everything. It will jump over the header. It will jump over all of our includes which are just copy and pastes from other files. It will jump over this determinant function that we just wrote, jump over that whole thing to start. You have to excuse my uh, songbird cat in the background. So now let's do some, uh, some Kramer's rule here. So the first thing we wanna do is we want to be able to compute the determinant of A for the original matrix A. To do that, all we do is we move into RDI. Remember, RDI is the input into our function here. That's our offsetting address. So we're passing into this determinant three by three function, the address of our array, the first uh, you know, byte, the first double. And that double here is at address A. A colon is just an address. So we can move into RDI the address called A. And then we're just gonna call determinant three by three. And what that does is uh, this uh, puts into XMM zero, as we just wrote, the determinant of A. And then I'm gonna save it into XMM 15 or something, just to keep it safe. I'll say XMM 15 equals determinant of A. Cool, that basically, this three lines, which is actually calling a much larger function that we just wrote, that basically does this. It computes the denominator for all of our evaluations, right? That is this. Determinant of A is what we use to compute the division here for every unknown Xi. Great. So now we have to compute the determinants of the other matrices. So the AIs. And what is AI? Remember AI was just the A matrix, the original A matrix with column vector B dumped in the corresponding column. Okay. Let me go back. So now let's uh, generate A1, which is A with column vector B. I'll say with B for column one. To do that, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to use that mem copy function to copy the original matrix A. So I'm going to move into RDI AI, the destination address. I'm gonna move into RSI, the address of the source. That's what usually RDI you use for the destination of something and sources for the source. So in this case, we're copying from A to AI. And how many bytes are we copying? We're copying eight times, well, eight bytes times nine elements or 72. So move into RDX 72. And this way will uh, AI uh, now contains a. So just to go over that again, mem copy was a function that we've written previously. Here you can see it takes in um, two pointers to to two memory locations, and then all you do is you pass in RDX how many bytes you want to copy, and it just copies bytes, you know, one by one or four by four, whatever it is, eight by eight maybe, from RSI into RDI. So that's what this part of the uh, the code does. So at this point, 
the AI address down here, which originally was all zeros, remember times nine zero, now it contains A. So literally exact copy of A will be in AI. Now, um, we were going to use our matrix insert column function to insert the column vector B into the vector uh, to the matrix AI. And so move into RDI, AI. Man, I have to do that. It may already be in AI. It may already be in RDI, but I'm going to do it anyway just for completeness sake. Move into RSI, the vector B, right hand side of vector B. Move into RDX. I believe this is, these are the size of the matrix A, I. So RDX is the number of rows, RCX is the number of columns. I think we've programmed that in. Um, and then the R8 contains the destination column. And so in this case, column zero is actually in, you know, in my definition, column, column one is column zero. So moving, basically moving vector B, moving, this vector into this column. That's what we're doing right now. So to do that, move R8 zero, and uh, that should that should work. Now let's, uh, well, okay, so at this point, let me see what we have. We have a AI now contains what we're calling A1, or what Wikipedia was calling A1. Let me show that again really quick. So this, now we contain A1, and now all we do is we, we compute the determinant of A1, and that's the numerator for our division, and we just divide that by our old value of the determinant of A, which we saved in XMM15, and that will give us our result, our solution uh, X, or that scale factor X. Okay, so let me just snag this really quick, and paste. Move that, call determinant. I'm gonna just get rid of this, no use. Just repeat that. And then I'm going to divide. Uh, XMM zero by XMM 15. Yep. So now, so I should have left that XMM zero contains the determinant of A1. We're dividing it by XMM 15, which was our original determinant value. And then we're moving it into, we'll say address X offset zero. This is the zeroth element of our solution vector, um, XMM zero. Okay. So that, that will generate for us the, uh, the first solution. Let's repeat that for the second and the third. So just copy and paste that really quick. Generate A2, column two, just change the comments really quick. Column three. A3, determine A3. Now the offsets are gonna change. Element three is 16 bytes offset, element two is eight bytes offset, and then the, the column that we insert is gonna be different. So R is gonna go from zero to one and from zero to two. That should just work. So now we have to print out our results. So let's see, to print out stuff, let's say uh, print results, print, X vector. So we move into RDI, the solution vector address, then we, uh, oh, sorry, we move into our RDI, the standard output, then we the source is the X vector address. Uh, move into RDX, the um, number of rows, which was three. RCX is number of columns, that's one. Um, what else is there? Oh, there's no extra offsets, so X or R8, R8. R9 contains the, the formatting of our print. We're just gonna say print float, oops. And then uh, 
number of sig figs is going to be in R10. And uh, now we're going to call call, uh, call print array float. And this should just work. I hope this works. If not, I made a mistake. Hold on a second here. That, that looked right to me. Um, let me put a, a new line here really quick. So move into RSI, have a grammar, move RDX one, call print cars. We'll make a grammar. Uh, line here. I usually do that. DB. Will that make it look better? No. Well, uh, either way, <laughs> I, I think the, uh, the result is correct. Hold on. Let me just check really quick to see if I've made any terrible mistake here. Maybe my uh, number is incorrect. That all matches. Just bear with me for a minute here. The, number, the answer is correct. I'm sure why is it not printing out right? Oh, I, I'm so, I'm retarded. Ugh. I have to flush the print buffer. I'm so dumb. Okay. Um, I don't even need this. I'm like, think to myself, what's going on? Why is this wrong? I guess you can see me trying to debug something in real time. You don't need to have that. So, um, flush print buffer. Novice mistake. Um, RSI. Or not even, just, I'll just say call print buffer flush. Right? That's what it is. There we go. And actually, let me go back and let me change that to more sig figs so we can see. Yeah, so these are apparently the solution to our problem. So x1 is 86.6, x2 is 50, and x3 is negative 43. Interesting, very interesting. Which, yeah, would suggest that Going back to the picture, um, F1 and F2 being positive numbers means that, yeah, our assumption that they were under compression is correct. F3 being a negative number means it's under, under tension, which makes sense. If we're pushing down here, these members are going to be in compression. And this member, if that's in compression, this is going to be in tension to oppose that which makes sense based off the signs. And if you plug in the numbers, I'm pretty sure you'll find that's the case. In fact, let me open up Octave. That's why I love Octave. We can uh, put in those values. And by the way, I already did this. Here are the same coefficients that we just uh, implemented in assembly <coughs> in vector A. Now, right-hand side vector, again, was 0, 100, 0. That's going to be vector B. And then in Octave or in MATLAB to solve 
these, you can just do a backslash or whatever that is B. And you can see here, if I uh, quit this, those values match what we computed with Kramer's rule ourselves from scratch in assembly. And so yeah, there's just an example. This video has been an hour in the making, including a little bit of a head scratcher there at the end, but thankfully we're, we're through it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I just wanted to show that, yeah, you can make completely functional software to solve real engineering problems in assembly without having to use C at all. No, no C whatever in, in the tool chain, unless you count NASM, unless you count the OS. I mean, whatever you want to do. But yeah, so this was Kramer's rule. I hope you enjoyed that uh, little uh, discussion there. And I hope you enjoyed this idea to have little, a few labs now and then where we just take previously existing code, apply it to a new problem, try and uh, make some valuable computations that are meaningful in some way and have fun in, in doing so. If you've watched this far, I would, I would invite you to our secret Discord server, the link at the bottom of the description. Um, check it out if you're interested. We can hang out. It's a couple of us there. We're pretty active. Um, and the, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys.